Our next speaker is uh, Dave Grijalva. He works for uh, NGMoco here in San Francisco. He's a Bay Area native, and uh, he likes the language Go because he thinks it's going to be popular. So, <laughs> uh, so anyway, Dave's going to talk to us about uh, things we can learn from Go that uh, will um, tell us more about Ruby. Good. Hello? Oh, it's working. Cool. All right. Um, so uh, there's a lot of reasons why I like Go. Uh, I think it's going to be popular because um, it, uh, it shares a lot of a lot of common traits with uh, Ruby, namely uh, sort of optimizing for for developer productivity. It has it has kind of a different purpose in that it's much lower level, um, and you do have to do a little more work than you do to, to do things in Ruby. But um, it's it's a super cool language, and it's really uh, it's only a few years old, and the community is really starting to pick up speed, and there's a lot of cool things that people are doing. So. Um, Quickly about me, I'm Dave. I, I uh, work at a company called NGMoco. We're just, uh, just down the street. Um, and um, okay, so uh, Go. So Go is a new programming language from Google. Uh, there's a team of people at Google who, who, who invented it, and it's really cool. It has a, a syntax that's like C. So if you're familiar with Ruby or you're familiar with C, uh, it should be pretty easy to read. Um, there's a few things that are different, but but um, uh, overall, it's, it's got a lot of the same uh, structures. Uh, it's statically compiled, so there's so you, you get a, actually a machine code compiled uh, binary out of it. There's no virtual machine, um, and there's also no like damn, blinking right now, which which makes uh, actually it a lot simpler to work with. Um, it's statically typed, um, and and it's not really object oriented. I, I, I this is kind of my term, but I'd say it's interface oriented, um, and I'll show you kind of what that means in a little bit. Um, it has some really really cool primitives uh, for doing concurrency. Um, and, and kind of a different approach to that, so you don't have to spend a bunch of time dealing with blocks and stuff like that. Um, it's garbage collected. It's uh, memory safe, so you, you don't have to worry about um, you know, if you do kind of overrun your, your uh, arrays, the program will crash instead of hackers taking over your computer, which is uh, good. And it's really, really fast, um, provided you do things correctly. So I'm going to talk uh, sort of a little bit about some of the syntactical things and things that are, that are um, interesting. It has multiple assignments. You're familiar with this from um, from Ruby, but one of the things that they do with it a lot, and you can see this in, in my se second example here, is um, uh, they've done away with exceptions almost completely, uh, and instead anything that, that any, any uh, function call that might return an exception and will return sort of the result object and, and an error object, and then you can check for the error instead of having an exception. So you end up with a split up, uh, with you know, sort of the, the try catch thing goes away when you're doing things like talking about a network, or you're trying to read a file, or any of that kind of stuff. Um, and, uh, that sort of troubled me a little bit at first. I thought it was going to be really messy, but the language actually does some nice things to make it easy to work with. Um, and then you can also, there's the underscore character, which, which is, is you've probably seen from a lot of other languages, where if you, if you only need one part of the return value of something, you can just kind of like throw the rest of it away. Um, the type system is really interesting. So uh, there are no, there's no classes, there's no objects. Um, uh, there are structs, which, which people use to construct uh, things that are, that are like classes, but there's also no inheritance, so that the, the actual object model is, is much simpler than, than like C++ or Ruby, where you have all these different types of inheritance and all kinds of magic stuff. Um, you kind of use uh, interfaces to, to do polymorphic uh, activities instead of, uh, instead of using inheritance for that. Um, and so here's a, just a few examples of defining your own type. You can make your own concrete type that, that is actually just has an underlying type of one of the simple types, like, for example, an integer. Uh, you can define structures. You can you can uh, uh, define types that are uh, function signatures, which is really useful if you're going to say make a thing that wants to accept a function and then do some you know, do some interesting stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, so uh, it also has. So this is this comes going back to sort of the, the, the type thing. Um, there are functions, and then there are there. Are, I, I like the term methods. And I think that's what they use in the documentation, which. Um, which is a, uh, a function that has a receiver. So the syntax is a little bit different. Uh, you can see in the first example here, the receiver is i, um, and then the, the function is string, which takes no arguments and returns a string. Um, and uh, this is really, this is sort of how you get polymorphic behaviors, is, is uh, you, would, you would define uh, an interface, and, and, uh, or, or even just, you could have, you don't really have to care what type the object is, if you can call string on it, you can call string on it. It's like, like that type. Only a little bit more explicit. Um, so this is interfaces, and uh, you know, the, the first example here is just declaring an interface. So an interface is just a collection of methods. You know, here's the name of the method. Here's what it receives. Here's what it returns. And 
hopefully in the documentation is what it does. Um, and uh, you can uh, you can then use an interface as a type. So it's all statically typed. You have to define what types you're gonna you're gonna um, what types you're gonna receive, what types you're gonna return. But you can use an interface as a type. So as an example of that, um, here the, the, the second example, uh, the io.reader is an interface. The io.reader is, inter is defined as a function that has the method read, which is super common. It's, it's used for a lot of things. And, and two examples are um, a file handle, which is which is which is returned from OS open, or a network connection, uh, a socket, which is returned from net dial. Both of those things, um, you can have one one variable or one function that, that, that's a that's an io.reader, and you can um, the only activity you can do on that thing is call read, but uh, you don't really have to care what type it is, and that's really useful for things like doing chaining and filters and things like that, where you can say um, chain a bunch of readers together, and then the end result, and then you, you just have to look at the one and, and, and you can do some, some clever things. The other thing, and this is used really commonly for especially like things like container types, is the empty interface. All types, including integer, boolean, you know, struct, all types have at least zero or more methods. So an empty interface um, can can just hold anything, um, and you have to do you have to do um, a little bit of introspection in the form of a, a type assertion to be able to do anything with an interface, uh, an interface object or an empty interface object, unless you just want to hold it. And uh, so there's a lot of container types that are implemented that use this, and there's uh, some other places where it works. So uh, there's there's uh, there's two things that I'm doing. The first one is, is the really common case, which is I have a I have an object. Um, uh, it could be like an empty interface type, or I don't I don't know what type it is, and I want to I want to use it as if it's another type. Um, and because everything's statically typed, you have to actually have an object of the right type in order to do the thing you want. So what we're doing here is uh, it's uh, we're saying is some bear of the type of my thingy, um, and the uh, the syntax here is actually uh, an if statement has like a like a before clause, like a for statement. So I'm actually the first thing I'm doing is I'm 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 assigning the result of that expression to to my thing and OK, and what what the type assertion will do is if it's actually the type that you want, it'll return a, a reference to that object in the correct type and it'll return true, um, and if not, you'll get sort of an empty value for for the one thing and you get false. And so what I'm doing the actual condition is just OK is OK true, uh, and if so, then then I have a, a, then I have the thing that I want. And so here I'm calling foo on it, which um, you would assume that, that my thingy has the method foo. Um, and then the other one is if, is if you're going to do, uh, if you're going to receive an object and you want to check and see what type it is, so this is really common for things like doing to JSON and things like that, where you wanted to say, give me a thing and I'll figure out what type it is and then figure out what to do based on that. There's a, there's a, uh, a nice syntax for, um, uh, for, for defining that in this case. If it's a string, it'll do the first thing. If it's, if it's my thingy with a typo, it'll do the second thing, and otherwise do this other thing. So it's it's like a, a specialized uh, case statement for um, for doing type insertion. Um, and those things are all, that's sort of basically uh, bits of the language, and I'll, and I'll show you some examples in a little bit. But but um, the place where Go gets really interesting is in its concurrency primitives and and, and how those are um, implemented and how you use them. The, the first thing to know about is, is called a Go routine. And a Go routine is basically a thread of simultaneous execution. So it's like another stack. Um, they're not actually threads. Um, there's a, there's a um, part of the runtime actually schedules Go routines on top of a thread pool. So um, they're, much, uh, they're much less expensive than threads. But actually creating one, it doesn't take very much memory. And it's not that expensive to start up. So you can have a lot more than you, than you would say threads. Uh, I know when you're writing like servers, the, the thread per connection model often will cause your server to explode if you have too many connections. But a Go routine per connection is actually a really uh, useful and, and practical way to do things. Um, so in this case, the first example is is pretty simple. It's just going to do call do something um, i times. The second time, the only difference is the inclusion of the keyword go. And so what this is saying is call this function. On a go routine, so it basically starts up a separate thing and then calls that function, and then that'll just run until it until you know the, the stack bottoms out, and then it just goes away. Um, so that's all you have to do to set up a go routine is just call go or call a function and, and tell it to go do that. Um, 
you can pass anonymous functions. So in this case, um, the first one is if you wanted to like do an inline that's similar to like JavaScript uh, anonymous functions or, or uh, just a block in, in Ruby. Um, the, the, the one catch is you have to actually, it actually has to be a function call. So in this case, I'm, uh, on the first example there, I'm, I'm defining an anonymous function and calling it, which is what those empty parentheses are, are at the end there. Um, but that works really well. Um, it's really common uh, practice. And the other one is this, it works with methods. So um, in the second case, with JavaScript, when you do stuff like this, you often end up having to like, make sure you bind your receiver and all that crap. But it actually just works. Uh, so it's nice. Um, and the other thing, and the part that um, where, where it gets really interesting is the way that you uh, communicate. So this is the thing that you'll see all over the Go documentation, and people on the forums will say this all the time. And, and, and what it's saying is, uh, you know, don't communicate by sharing memory, share memory by communicating. So uh, in the common concurrency, concurrent programming pattern is locks and mutexes and all that stuff. And, and the way that you're, that you're doing that is you're actually communicating between a whole bunch of simultaneous threads of execution uh, by sharing memory, where you have some shared state and you use locks to make sure that no one's accessing the wrong thing at the wrong time. But really, most of, most of the reason you're doing that is for communication. There's a couple, a couple other examples, but, but uh, so instead, Go provides a primitive, and actually new techs are available, but that's kind of a side note. Go provides a primitive for sharing memory by communicating and actually um, kind of doing away with mutexes in most cases. Um, it's called a channel. And a channel is basically a queue with a type. So in this first example, I'm making a, a chan of the type integer. So what it is, is it's a queue that you can write, you can send and receive integers on this channel. And it's all, it's, uh, all the operations on it are atomic. Um, so you don't have to worry about blocking access to it. You can just send it an integer and it'll, and something else can read that integer out. And they can be buffered or unbuffered. Um, and uh, that's really important when it, uh, because um, if you write to a channel that doesn't have any more space, it'll block. And you'll block until that write succeeds. Um, and the same is true for trying to read from an empty channel. It'll block until that read succeeds. So you can actually use a channel for synchronization um, just by having an unbuffered channel and you can, you can kind of wait on something else to send you a signal, which is a really common pattern. Um, but if you're going to be, say, doing a sort of a, a generator consumer model of something, you might want to be able to buffer out a little bit so you have some more um, some more runway, just in case, uh, you know, in case you can generate faster than the consumers can consume, or, or the other way around. Um, and so you can you can define that. Here's the syntax for operating on channels. Uh, to send to a channel, and basically, in this case, I'm just sending uh, one to channel C. Um, in, in the bottom case, I'm uh, I'm receiving whatever whatever the first integer on C is in, into into the variable I. Um, and there's another really awesome uh, construct, which is a select statement, which looks a lot like a case statement, only it's specifically for doing channel operations. And this is really cool because, um, um, because you, you may, there may be a bunch of different things that you want to do concurrently, and, if, and you don't have to do any kind of polling or, or wacky behavior. You can actually say, in this case, I have two different channels. I want to receive from both of them. Whichever one uh, gives me data first is the one that's going to that's going to happen, and if they, actually, if they both already have data waiting, they'll go in, in the order that they're defined. Um, but um, uh, in this case, I'm just saying receive the thing and, and, and print it out. And hopefully, your application will do something more interesting. Uh, and you can use it for non-blocking behavior. So, just like the case, the switch statement has a default. Uh, the select statement has a default. So, in the first example, I'm going to try and receive something from this channel. But if the channel is empty and I don't want to wait, uh, I just put a default case and it'll fall through into the default case and you can do something like, I didn't get a value, and go, you could do something else that's interesting. Or uh, you can come back later or do whatever you want to do. And non-blocking send is also really useful in the case where you have, um, if you're just, say, producing log data. And you, don't, you, you want to be able to just send this thing into the log data and hopefully there's a consumer out there that's going to receive it, but if the consumers slow down because of I.O. problems or whatever and your logs aren't that important, you might just want to say, try to log it, but just throw it away. It doesn't, it doesn't work, so you can do that. Or you can do something else, just, you know, depending on what you want to do. Um, and then another common pattern is uh, using a select for a timeout. So uh, all of the, the built-in timer operations operate on uh, operate using, um, using uh, channels. And usually what they'll do is whenever the timer is fired, uh, they'll actually just send the time on the channel. And so in this case, 
uh, I want to, I've got, I'm waiting on something from my chat A. I hope it comes in before whatever my deadline is. But if it doesn't, I'm just going to fall through and time out and go do something else, like throw an error or do uh, something else. So uh, demo time. Let's see if I can get it. Um, this is actually a really good, a really good place to start. Um, so here's a really simple case of kind of a uh, producer-consumer model uh, implemented in Go using channels and Go routines. Um, I have a function main, which is the thing that gets called in the starts. starts. And what I'm doing is I'm going I'm to create a channel here um, called C, and I'm going to call this function produce, which I'll show you in a second, with Go. So it's going to spawn up a Go routine, call produce with those parameters. And Go returns immediately. It just starts that thing off and then uh, returns. It. So uh, as soon as I do that, I'm going to loop through. I'm going to I'm going to call consume. And I'm going to do that a bunch of times. Uh, Ten in this case. Um, and the rest of the thing I'll, I'll come back to what that is. But so uh, here is the uh, the produce method, and it's just basically a Fibonacci sequence generator. Um, I'm using basically doing the entire generation in the in the for loop using parallel assignment and all different places in the top there. And then I'm just generating a number and sending it along the channel. Uh, and I'm going to do that until the result is higher than my limit, which, which we set up, which I think is 1,000. Um, and then I have 10 of these guys running also concurrently. And these are the consumers. And what they're going to do is they're going to sleep for a random amount of time, assuming that in a real program they would be doing actual work. Um, they're going to sleep for a random amount of time, and then they're going to try and receive um, they're going to try and receive something out of out of that channel, and they're going to just print it out to the, to the console. So, oh my gosh, Let's see what that looks like here. Uh, it's pretty simple. So, um, you know, it's it's gone all the way through. It was it ran really fast, assuming a bunch of things all the time. Um, and I have the channel that I'm creating right now is. Is unbuffered. So you can see that the producer, that there's there's a there's an alternation directly of I produce a thing and then I consume a thing. There's a couple places where the logging kind of screws that up, but that's that's what's happening. It's, it's it's producing a thing and then something is consuming it. And the order at which the consumers are actually consuming something is random. So I'm using the I'm using that channel to kind of load balance. There's ten things waiting on something to come into the channel, and one of them will get it, and the other ones will just wait. So I can kind of like spread my load out that way. But um, because the channel is unbuffered, uh, the, the Fibonacci generator will generate one value, and it'll actually block on writing that value to the channel until something tries to read it out. Once something reads it out, it'll, it'll be able to continue, loop around one more time, and generate another thing. If I wanted to uh, actually get better concurrency there, I could change this channel, so I could put a buffer on it. Now it's buffered a buffer of 10, and I can. Uh, Make and you'll see this looks really different because the producer produces a whole bunch of stuff and just is like filling up the buffer as fast as it can, um, and the consumers will then all be able to just run and, and consume out of the thing because all of those integers that I was generating are are, are being are waiting in the buffer. So um, it's a really simple example of kind of using the uh, uh, using that to. Um, so now I'm going to do something a little, a little more interesting. Um, I have a little thing here called uh, Twitter, which is, uh, have you, has anyone here worked with the Twitter streaming API? The Twitter streaming API is, is, is actually really simple. You make a GET request to, to a web server, and it just streams you uh, JSON objects that are, that are tweets. And you can actually get, in this case, I'm going to just get kind of a, a random sampling of all of the tweets that are happening. It's not, all, it's not the whole firehose you can pay for that. It's a subset. But um, uh, um, the sort of the interesting part is, is here I'm, I'm doing an HTTP GET request, setting my authentication thingy, which I'm going to read from a config file. Um, and what, what actually the response object uh, from, from, from doing an HTTP request uh, includes, includes the property body. Body is an IO reader. Um, and an IO reader, I can just keep reading from until I get EOF. So I have what I what I do is 
I'm starting a, uh, the program will start up. It'll uh, it'll connect to Twitter and start getting this kind of unlimited, never-ending HTTP response. Um, and I'm going to just store that thing and and call process, which is uh, which is here. And uh, where is it? Um, okay, so inside of process, there's a little bit of setup noise, and then. Um, I'm using a, a JSON decoder. JSON decoder actually can just read JSON objects out of out of an I/O reader. So I, you see, I'm giving it the, the I/O reader, and um, I'm using this decode function uh, here to um, to what it'll do is every time this calls, every time I call this, it will um, decode the next JSON object on that's that's in that's in that buffer um, into the next update uh, thing which I'm passing there, and uh, return nil if there's no error, or return an error if something went wrong. Connection closed on me or something like that. Um, and I'm then taking uh, taking that update and piping it to this channel. So you can see I have a. Let me actually show that real quick. Uh, the the type here I have is this raw string type, which I have um, a channel for, for sending updates, and I have uh, the the body which I'm keeping track of. So I have a channel that something else I'm presuming is going to be able to, is going to start reading these tweets. And so they're they're like complete parsed tweets. I'm parsing them into a struct. That's really easy to work with, um, which is what I'm, I'm, I'm constructing right here. And I'm sending this along this channel. And uh, hopefully something else will, uh, will receive that. We have a simple application which uses that library called TCAP, um, which, uh, which all it does is, this is a big partial thing. It sets up the Twitter stream, and it reads. Uh, it basically will loop forever and just read those update structures off of the off of that channel and just print them out to the console. Um, so if I go here, I can actually run this and see. Um, this is live Twitter data. Um, however much data they're willing to give me um, at once, and that's pretty cool. Um, but I'm not doing a lot of stuff in parallel. I'm kind of like reading a thing and. But, uh, so th there's an interesting point here, which is which is I'm using concurrency, even though I'm kind of only doing things one thing at a time, because the I have one thing which is really only concerned about reading things off of off of the queue. It kind of is this infinite loop of just reading things off of this network stream and doing something interesting with it and then handing it off. And then somewhere else, I've got another thing which all it's doing is receiving those things that have been parsed by some other thing and printing them out to the console. Um, and if you uh, if you, if you tweet right now, you might be able to see it, but probably not. Um, uh, so that, that's kind of interesting. But um, <laughs> is there something good? Uh, um, but I want to get more. I want to get more. Uh, do something that's, that's a little more interesting. Here's uh, another application which uses that Twitter library also, um, and the only difference really is instead of uh, instead of writing out to the console, I'm going to create a WebSocket server using literally that many lines of code uh, to create a WebSocket server, and then I'm going to be able to go to browse browse to the uh, uh, browse to this and watch the same stream in the web, which is a little bit more interesting. Um, so. So that'll start up, and then in order to see that, I need um, a browser. Just open up where. So here's the same thing, and what's happening is that little application that I'm running is receiving that same Twitter feed, and then it's hosting a WebSocket server, and. Uh, This code here is actually this is this is that example I was talking about before of, of sort of one um, one go routine per connection. So, this, so, so for each client that's connected, um, there's there's one instance of this loop that's running. And basically, what it's doing is uh, there's there's another go routine that's kind of taking the, the tweets and multiplexing them across all the open connections. 
and then this thing is, is formatting them for the WebSocket API and, and forwarding it down to the user. And we'll just leave it at JavaScript. You can see all of this stuff as it streams by. Um, that's cool. Uh, so. All right, so let's talk about Ruby. So, one of the, uh, I think that, oh, I'm, I'm almost out of time, so I'm gonna have to go fast, but um, I think that, that uh, one of the things that's really cool about Ruby is it's an incredibly flexible language, especially because of, of blocks and stuff, you can, you can do a lot of interesting things with like DSLs and stuff like that, and you can actually take um, a lot of the uh, concepts from Go and, and actually use them in Ruby to make more readable programs that do certain types of things where this type of an API is appropriate. One of them is built right in. Uh, Ruby 1.9 fibers, very few people look at that thing. It's actually really cool and really useful, and, and um, I hope if I can make it, I have one example of that. And uh, another example of someone who's actually taken this much more literally is um, Ilya Grigoric, I hope I said that correctly, he's uh, speaking tomorrow, uh, has a project called Agent, which actually is literally taking the Go routine and channels uh, idea and implementing that in Ruby 1.9 and it's a super cool project. And I have really quick examples I can show you of both of those things, hopefully. Um, the first one is uh, this one. No. The first one is this. So here's, here's an implementation of uh, the Fibonacci consumer, uh, producer consumer that uses, uh, that uses a, a Ruby 1.9 fiber instead of uh, a Go routine in Go. And it's almost identical. It's a loop here, and the only difference is, 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 is uh, I'm calling yield. So the way this works is, is both Go routines and, and Ruby fibers are um, cooperative multitasking. So the, the, it's like a thread that kind of decides when it's done versus instead of the, the operating system deciding when it's done or deciding when to switch across. So anytime you call yield in, inside of a fiber, it basically waits until it's resumed, and then it'll kind of keep going. So um, I'm producing my, the, the things here, and then I just have a loop that looks like this. Um, which is called Chan Resume. And every time it calls Chan Resume, it'll, it'll uh, let the, kind of unyield the fiber and let the fiber continue going. So it's a nearly identical example. I'm not gonna run it for you because uh, it does the same thing as the, the other one. Um, here's an example of, uh, here's an example of, of Agent um, doing actually the same, the same code again. In this case, I've set up a channel here uh, and there's a little bit more noise, but you can tell it's a, it's a type, it's a, it's a channel that receives an integer. I set that up, I call go here, and I tell it to produce the thingy, and I say, like, here's the channel we're right to write to. And then I do the same thing here, and I say, 10 times, create a go routine that's going to consume from that channel. Uh, and you can see the code looks almost identical to the go code, only it's Ruby. Um, in this case, the, the, the sort of double arrow thing is, is a send, and receive is an explicit receive command. Um, you can see it's doing almost the, the exact same thing. There's a little bit more code in here that I'm not talking about, which is sort of managing closing down all these things that are running in parallel, but it's also really simple. Um, I'm, I'm completely out of time, but there's, there's another, uh, I also implemented the TCAP thing in Ruby. It's, um, this code is available on GitHub if you want to look at it, or if you want to ask me questions about it. Um, so one quick plug for hiring. Uh, we're actually gonna, gonna be hosting a, a, um, a happy hour uh, from 5.30 to 7.30 at the pub, so like waiting for the shuttle or whatever, if you want to come by and ask me questions and have a, have a drink on us, uh, do that, because uh, I'd like to see you all. Um, and then I, I'm kind of out of time, but, but um, that's the URL for the, for the code, if you want to see it. And I've got, I'll be hanging out if you have questions or, or come find me at the pub. Thank you.